Well, good morning. Welcome to Trinity. Glad you're joining us today. I thought we would look at the Genesis passage. We're in the book of Genesis all through track one this summer, and they're all the way up to 25. Genesis is such a rich book. I absolutely love the book of Genesis. I actually, in my parish in Atlanta, we spent the whole summer going through Genesis one time. Perhaps we'll do that when you're around here. But as we jump in, we see Genesis being the first book in the Bible. The word Genesis literally means in the beginning or beginnings. And there's an old saying that says, if you get Genesis wrong, you get the whole Bible wrong. It's important that we understand this wonderful book. It's important that we understand Genesis. And it's vitally important that we understand the idea that the Bible is primarily about God and his work for humanity, not about us and our work for him. The Bible is about God and what he has done through history and through the church, but it's not about how we do our part. It's how he fully did his part. And so with that said, make no mistake, God is restoring humanity and building his kingdom, and he is going to do what he said he would do, and he's going to do it in a way he sees fit. And this includes the promise to make a great nation, a great nation that began in Genesis 25, as you heard read just a moment ago in our first lesson read by Ben. Now, set the scene, Isaac is being given a wife. She was given that wife last week, you might remember the reading. And it's a wonderful wife, a wife that he loved. He was a picky dude, as you know, who waited 40 years before settling down with the right girl, the girl of his dreams, Rebecca. But there was a problem. Rebecca could not have children. She was barren like her mother-in-law, Sarah. And so it is here in the story of redemption that God steps in to do what he set out to do. And that is where the story of beginnings picks up today in verse 19. Here's what it says. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son, Abraham's father, Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethel, the sister of Laban, to be his wife. But there is a test. What is the test, you might ask? You see, after 40 long years of looking for the right girl and nothing, Isaac still has not married. And his mother Sarah had died and was, or was dying, and Abraham, his father, is getting old and antsy. So Abraham steps up and sends his servant back to his homeland to find a girl of his kindred in the land of Mesopotamia. And there the servant finds Rebekah and brings her home and it's love at first sight. Finally, marriage has happened for God's chosen. They let no time pass. They immediately start trying to have children. But there is a problem. Rebecca is barren. And I can only imagine that Isaac does everything he can to fix this. They go to the town doctor to no avail. And so at the end of the rope and out of ideas, Isaac prays to the Lord. I love this scripture in verse 21. He says, Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife. That word prayed, athar is the Hebrew word. It literally means to plead. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on his wife's behalf to give her children. He does what Abraham, his father, didn't do. Remember, Abraham took matters into his own hands when his wife Sarah could not have children. He had a child with his maid, but not Isaac. He turned to the Lord in the time of need. When the test came, he turned to God. Now, here is where many times we turn this fruit, this gift of prayer, into a new law. You see, it would be so easy for me to say, husbands, the best thing you can do for your wife is to pray for them. And if you are not, then shame on you. You need to take the example of Isaac and start tonight praying for your wife with the unsaid statement that if you don't, you're bad. But friends, that's not the point of what's happening here. And that's not the gospel. Isaac did not plead with the Lord because his rabbi the week before in the synagogue told him he should. No, he prayed for his wife 
out of desperation, out of, I can't do this anymore, and she can't do this anymore, I can't fix this, and I can't fix her, and I need help. Help me, Lord, in my lack of faith. That was the plea. You see, he knew the promise of God was to bless his line, and he knew God was going to do what he said he was going to do. In a way, he is praying, Father, not my will be done, but your will. Now, of course, Isaac wanted children, just like every other Jewish couple, but he was more concerned about God's plan to fulfill his covenant and blessing. The whole world would be blessed through it. And that is why we see Isaac praying with his heart bent toward heaven. He's at the end of himself. Some scholars believe that this was a test for Isaac to bring him to the place of utter surrender to God. We have seen this type of test before, especially in the Old Testament. God had to bring Abraham to that place. He took time with Abraham over and over again. We see God's patience and grace upon Abraham, Isaac's father, as he mercifully kills the old Adam in him, a.k.a. sin of Abraham. Friends, the Lord does not the same for us. He mercifully kills us over and over and over in an effort to draw us to himself. In our fast-paced, gotta-have-it-now culture, waiting is not part of the equation. But God uses times of waiting to grow us. And we often see that no isn't always a fast no. But sometimes it's a simply wait. Trust me. You see, I have found in tough times of waiting, God has used it to do three things in my heart. Waiting always deepens my insight into what I really need. Often I think I need it or want something, and it turns out I really don't need it, and it passes by. Number two, waiting has expanded my understanding and appreciation of the answer. I think we all can look back at what God has done and see that all things, good or bad, have worked out for our good. And number three, I've noticed that waiting provides space for me to mature so that I'm ready for the answer when it comes. God knows us, he created us, and he will never put more on our plate than we can handle. You say, Jonathan, you've not seen my plate this week. If it's overflowing, I'm about to tap out. If it's on your plate, you can handle it. If you are here today and you feel overwhelmed, stop trying to fix it or improve it or manipulate it and cry out to God the same way Isaac did. Plead with God to help and let him fix the situation in the way that he chooses to fix it. Stop trying to be Mr. Fix-It. And we can move forward when we realize that God has it under control. The one that can move mountains can move our hearts and our lives in the direction that he needs to. I get the impression that Isaac knew God was going to work. He knew it in here, but he didn't know it up here. But God was a way of God has a way, I should say, of getting our attention and teaching us his will. Richard Hendricks, a theologian, once said, second only to suffering, waiting may be the greatest teacher and trainer in godliness, maturity, and genuine spirituality most of us ever encounter. Friends, this has been true for me, particularly as I have experienced all kinds of things and experientially, to be honest. You know, we tend to have the same heart as Isaac, knowing God is in control, but not knowing. And we tend to want God to answer and to jump when we say so. The instant society we live in encourages that. Everything is instant in our life. Think about it. We have instant coffee, instant breakfast, instant soup and oatmeal. You throw it in the microwave, and 30 seconds later, you got a hot meal or a hot beverage. And that's the way life works. And if you're a businessman or you own a company or you're in charge of something, when you tell your employees to do something, you expect them to do it. 
Heaven forbid that we have to actually wait for something. But the kingdom of God doesn't work that way. You see, God's church does not work that way. We don't tell God what to do. He tells us what to do. And he does it his way always. And in his time, always. Because time is ultimately, well, it's in his hands. The psalmist actually reminds us of that in Psalm 31, 15. My times are in your hands. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from my persecutors. Words spoken by another man at the end of his rope, crying out to God for help, pleading with God, not because the rules say to, but because he had no other option. He has nothing else to cling to. And the good news, my friends, is God has ordained the steps of every one of us in this church before the beginning of time, and his will and mission will go forth regardless of what we do or don't do. <clears throat> this is a common theme throughout Genesis. You see the very clearly in this passage today, it would be 20 years of waiting and wanting a child before God would bless them with the twins. And Scripture says <clears throat> the twins struggled within Rebekah. Now, you guys are not listening fast enough or running out of time. Listen to what it says real quickly, verse 22. The children struggled together within her and said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. I get this funny picture in my mind, my head. These two little babies were going at it in the womb. I don't even know what that's, po if that's possible. I have a picture of WWF as a kid. My brother and I watched WWF every Saturday morning and we would jump off the back of the couch and body slam one another. That's the picture I get. Jacob and Esau are going at it. Jacob has Esau in a headlock. And I'm not sure what's happening, but Rebecca is miserable. The struggle going on in Rebecca's womb was more than just normal fetal movement. It wasn't just a little kick here and a jab here. This was like war raging in her. In fact, the Hebrew word used indicates the children were smashing themselves inside of her. The literal, literal word is the same word used to describe skulls being smashed together in Judges 9, 53. Or reeds being broken in Isaac 36, 6. It was a violent struggle within Rebecca's womb. There was womb warfare going on. And Rebecca is now at the end of her rope. And so what does she do? She cries out to the Lord. An example she saw her husband do 20 plus years earlier. And her cry is simply this. If it is so, why then am I this way? You can hear the plea in her voice. Why then do I ever become pregnant? Why do I keep on living? Did you catch that? Rebecca was puzzled by the internal struggle so much that she prays to God for an answer. In the face of infertility, Isaac responds in prayer. And now in the face of a difficult pregnancy, Rebecca responds this prayer. Isaac and Rebecca both knowing God and worshiping him as God. And now at the point of a stretched faith, they turn to him rather than to each other to their, or to their friends or to the world. Why is this important? Because it shows that their faith was real. And so at this key juncture in her life, she went to God. Have you ever been there? Maybe you're there today. Maybe you need a little wisdom for life today. Turn to God. Fall towards God. Again, not as a new rule, <clears throat> but as out of desperation. Fall to the one who knows you by name and has it all worked out for you. James 1.5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Isn't that... Good news to know that the phone line to God is always open. He's always available to those who he died for. Friends, as we wrap up this sermon, I want to remind you, as I did 
last week, as I do regularly, to be honest, that you are loved more than you could ever imagine. And you are more valuable to King Jesus than all the gold in the world. And because that is true, you can literally fall toward him in prayer with anything. As I said a moment ago, prayer is a fruit that is gifted to you as a child of God. We don't pray and turn to him because we have to. We pray and turn to him because we get to, because he cares and because he's there. So let's do just that. Let's turn to God with our hearts, with our deepest heart's needs and desires, and ask him to meet us in that place where it's all falling apart. And I promise you, he'll do it. He'll do it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, before we come to you and say the Nicene Creed together, I pray for our friends in television land that are watching this right now. I pray for the person that is at the end of their rope, the person who feels like they've been waiting 10, 15, 20, maybe 50 years for an answer. I pray that you will build their faith, that you will answer their heart's cry, that they will move past the days of mourning and sadness and uncertainty and into the land of knowing, knowing they are loved, knowing they have a way forward, knowing that they belong. In Jesus' name, amen.